with a prayer, but I've got a little bit different start for today. That was the miracle for the weekend in uh, Tennessee beat Alabama. But uh, let's start off with a prayer. Father, I do thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. I thank you for everyone that is here. We, we are here because we seek to hear your voice. Uh, we seek to, to just hear a fresh word from you, to, to have you reveal yourself in new and amazing ways. So, Father, we just pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit to uh, guide and direct us, to help us to, to just give you the very best of our voices and our minds and our hearts as we come and worship you today. And we ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. join in turn your eyes upon Jesus we'll go sing through twice Gosh, that's beautiful. It is good to see everybody here this morning. And uh, we've got a lot of people that are still missing. Who goes on vacation in October? Oh, yeah. Well, we've still got some missing people. So in the military, it would be, what, what do they used to say? All leave is canceled until morale increases. Um, it, is, it is a beautiful day, and I'm just so happy to, to see everybody here. And uh, you guys bless me by your, your presence, and uh, I just thank you for that. A couple of, uh, of announcements that I do want to make, uh, just so we make sure that we get those out there. Uh, this Wednesday, the 19th, is that, the, is that this Wednesday already? Gosh. Uh, we're going to have an information meeting uh, concerning the disaffiliation of, of, of our church. Um, what, what I want to try to put out there is kind of a, a little bit of a background of how we got to where we are, kind of the, some of the history that has been, been uh, that we've, we've gone through. Uh, that's what that's about. If you're interested in, in hearing that, uh, please come. We'll have some time to answer some questions. The, uh, the Teacher's Closet Network meeting is at Ebenezer, and that'll be on Thursday the 20th. Um, 
and and um, you guys are just awesome. Let me tell you, you, you really are. So there is next Sunday. There is the pastor appreciation covered dish luncheon. Um, you know, my, my I, I I pray every morning that um, that when people see me, they see God, and so really this is a. Uh, let's turn this into a what God is doing at Grace Chapel Appreciation Sunday next Sunday. But please uh, come bring a cover to supper. Anybody like um, key lime pie? Okay, okay. I'm going to try key lime pie this time. And and let me just warn you: don't you dare try to get me at the front of that daggum line. I did that when I first came here. I'm not going to do it ever again. I will be at the back of the line. So just be prepared. Uh, and then on Thursday, October the 27th, we have uh, the district superintendent is going to come and, and have another meeting again concerning the disaffiliation. Uh, what she is going to kind of present to us is the, the leadership's vision of what the United Methodist Church would look like going into the future uh, and where, uh, you know, conservative churches and liberal churches, how they can kind of mesh together. Uh, come and, and if you want to, to, to be a part of that, uh, just to get that information. I, I just want you to be informed about everything before we take the vote. We'll probably have another information meeting the week after that in case anybody has questions about what the DS talked about so we can talk about it. And we just want to get it all out there for everybody. Uh, and then October the 30th, uh, track and treat. Again, it's going to be a great opportunity to reach out to our, to our neighbors. Uh, so please, uh, if, if you can come and be a part of that, uh, I, Josh isn't here to give me the times again, but we're going to park our cars around the track. Um, if you can't be a part of that, uh, like I said, I, I'm estimating about 9,000 pieces of candy that we need to, to be have on hand uh, to give out. So if you just want to bring some candy, uh, and a lot of people already have, and I've gone and checked, uh, and, and you guys are awesome in that too, because I saw very few of those nasty little Tootsie Roll in those bags so get, get the good stuff you know well you all, you all are getting the good stuff but let me just commend you on that um, you know I, I used to go to a church where they, they got the, the the Walmart you know blue light special all Tootsie Rolls and, and things that nobody liked but uh, you guys are doing great so uh, I think that is everything anything did I miss anything okay let's continue our worship as we uh, worship God with our tithes and offerings
Christ and God of Glory, hymn number 577. I say it every Sunday. I, I keep trying to think of something new to say, but I just can't. I, I love our prayer time. I, I love the time when we can come and, and bring our joys and our concerns and our fears and, 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 and give them to God because um, God is just awesome. And if, you, if you've not picked up anything else out of the book of Daniel study, I hope you've learned that God is uh, in control and, and God can, can respond to our prayers. So. Uh, is there anything we'd like to bring forward this morning? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We celebrated an amazing life of, of uh, Merlene Hilton Friday, just an amazing woman. And so we just want to be in prayers for, for, for that family uh, during this time. Continued prayers for my sister, Willie Jean Noggle. She's still in ICU, uh, not doing well yet. And uh, so please pray for her and her family and all of us who are trying to go up and down the road to visit with her and be there. Continue prayers for Meredith, our daughter, as well. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. My mother, Betty, too. Me and Lisa celebrated our service. 
Amen. <laughs> I was thinking that we need to continue to pray for patience for Lisa. I mean, but <laughs> that's great. Do we have any others? Yes, ma'am. Good to see you back up, up and on your feet. That, that's good. Okay, let's take these and any unspoken we have to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you again just for the day you've given us. I, I thank you that uh, you have created this community of faith, this this family uh, that comes together and loves you and worships you and. Just, just looks to you in both the good times and the bad. And so, Father, as we bring to you our, our worries, our concerns, our fears, our hurts, uh, we, we just place them in your hands. And we know that you um, are with us, that you travel with us. Uh, and, Father, that in your perfect uh, vision that you will answer our prayers. Uh, so we pray with great confidence. Uh, Father, we also thank you for all the joys that come into our lives. Uh, we know that every good thing is from you, and so we thank you for that. Uh, so, Father, just uh, thank you for being the good Father that you are. Uh, you know, Father, we pray for our church here. We pray for uh, just this community. Father, we pray that you will guide us and lead us. Help us to be the church that you have, have created us to be. Uh, and Father, help us to get out into our communities and be your hands and feet and face and voice. Uh, Father, we especially thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who came and lived a life that we couldn't live. He, he gave us an example of how we should strive to live. But more importantly, Father, he died on that cross so that we could be forgiven and we could be restored with you. And so we join together and pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Amen. Let me invite the children to, uh, that would like to go to Children's Church. They are released now. Our children are awesome. I, I love our kids. I love to hear them scream, uh, you know, because they're, they're, just, they're just saying what the rest of you are feeling. You just won't say it.
Amen. Uh, I don't know if you all heard it or not. Uh, they talk about a, the choir of angels. Uh, there were more than four people singing over there because I heard it. There, there had, I mean, you had the angels in heaven singing right along with you. Gosh, that was good. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to commend all of y'all. Uh, I want to actually applaud y'all because you have almost completed the study of Daniel. Uh, Twelve chapters, so we'll finish up next week. The longest sermon series I've ever done. Uh, it was a good thing. I thought about the, the book of Isaiah, but there's 53 chapters in that. Lord have mercy, we'd, we'd be here for years. Uh, but but t- next week, we'll finish up the uh, book of Daniel. Uh, I'm not sure what we're going to do the week after that, but the week after that, November the 6th, we're going to have a group come, and they're going to do lead us in worship. Uh, they're called Bear Wallow. And uh, they are kind of a, 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 a Gaither-style kind of southern gospel music. Uh, they're phenomenal. You don't want to miss it. In, invite your friends. Invite whoever. Uh, you definitely want to be here for that. But, uh, so we've got uh, this Sunday and next in, in the book of Daniel. And you know, I, I just think the book of Daniel is it's just a treasure chest for the serious Christian. The first six chapters gives us hope. Uh, as we learn from the life of Daniel and how, uh, how we can live in a modern day Babylon uh, that we're living in. Because we are. We're living in a society of, of decreasing faith uh, and increasing hostility towards people of faith. <coughs> and if you remember, Daniel, along with his, his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they were taken into exile into Babylon when they were just boys. And they lived the rest of their lives there in Babylon. And the deal is that they didn't just survive uh, in this hostile society, but they thrived. And, and through their example, uh, we gain hope as we realize that we can thrive as well in this society that we're living in. And then these last six chapters, uh, we gain even more hope and, and confidence and assurance as we see that, that prophecies given to Daniel actually came true in history. And it came true. Hundreds of years after the prophecies were given to Daniel, we see them coming true. And what we gain from that, from this last half of the book of Daniel, is the assurance, the assurance that God holds history in His hands. Uh, that, that God is in complete control of, of history. Uh, and as you think about God being in control, I just, it just gives me great comfort. And, and I hope um, it does you too. Um, even in the midst of difficult weeks or whatever that you might be going through, God's in control. Uh, secondly, uh, from the prophecies given to Daniel, we gain kind of an understanding of uh, the timeline of history and just where we are on that timeline. If, if you remember... Uh, the timeline that I gave out several Sundays ago, and there might still be some out there. Um, if not, let me know. I'll get you one. Um, and, and it kind of showed actually where we are. And, and I believe from Daniel and others that we're getting very near to the end of God's timeline as we wait for the return of Christ and the coming of his kingdom. To help put things into perspective for, for chapter 11, uh, most of us are far more familiar with the events of the 1700s and the 1800s than we are with events of 500, 400, 300 B.C. Uh, so just imagine that there is a book that is found, and it was written in the 1300s sometime, the, the 14th century. Um, it, this was over 200 years before the Mayflower and the Pilgrims. And let's suppose that as you read this book, it speaks about a small boat crossing the ocean. It talks about a, a conflict between natives and newcomers. Uh, it, it tells about a covenant between 13 districts, the, the rise of mechanical tools used for agriculture. And it talks about uh, this, this boat that can cross the land on rails. All written in the 1300s sometime. I mean, I just, do you suppose that, that a book like that would gain any kind of attention? 
Do you suppose that a historian would, would be interested in studying that book? And, and let's suppose that the book went on to prophesy about a, a great war between the North and the South, the assassination of a leader, you know, another war that, that included the entire world, and a great financial collapse that left millions destitute and dying. You know, all written three to four hundred years before it happened. Any historian worth their salt would read this book and, and they would ask the question, who wrote this and how did they know? And they would put a lot of authority on the person that was able to write a book such as that. This is what we're dealing with in Daniel chapter 11. Now let me just tell you the last couple of chapters, Daniel 11, it is a difficult read. It's pretty tough. There's a lot going on in there, and there's uh, not a lot of explanation to it, uh, mainly because uh, none of it had happened yet. But we have the advantage of reading Daniel 11 in the context of history that has already happened. So we're looking back on it. And, and what I hope that we're going to see today in Daniel chapter 11 is that, that it is a gold mine of treasure for the careful student. And when I say the careful student, I mean the student who is willing to study this chapter with an open mind and an open Bible in one hand and an open history book in the other because that's really what you've got to do in order to get something out of this. Because Daniel chapter 11 is a chapter of prophecies made and prophecies fulfilled. Um, and as we begin to see the prophecies fulfilled, you know, we, we find our own faith being strengthened. Uh, the, the reading is, is tedious, um, but it plays kind of a central role in the Daniel story. Um, it reinforces the theme of the entire book, really, and that theme is that there is a God in heaven and that God is in control. Uh, and today, according to Daniel chapter 11, there is a God in heaven who directs history. Um, he is his working the way of history towards his desired outcome. Um, God prophesies the future, and then God fulfills those prophecies. And Daniel uh, 11, uh, it is the, we find the fourth and the final vision that is given to Daniel. And Daniel 11 forecasts events that happen around 350 to 400 years in the future. So remember, Daniel is writing around 435 B.C. in this chapter here. Uh, we know that because it speaks about the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia. So that would date today's writings around 535 B.C. And he's writing about events that happen around 300 to 250 B.C. So you're looking into the future. Uh, now, it, it might interest you uh, that... Daniel chapter 11 has been a battleground of scholars for over a couple hundred years now. Uh, mainly because many, uh, the, the many intricate components of the prophecy in Daniel 11 uh, that have come true. Some scholars, they suggest that the book of Daniel was written several hundred years later, around 160 B.C., after these events have transpired. They, they cannot believe that the book that Daniel was able to accurately predict all these details in advance. Um, but foretelling the future is not difficult for God. Um, as, as God stated in Isaiah, he says, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that have not yet done. Additionally, uh, you know, you've got the other prophecies in the book of Daniel, uh, such as the prophecy that uh, gave us the exact date that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, 500 years in the future. You know, they, they, these other prophecies were fulfilled just as predicted. And so it gives us the confidence that God also provides the details found in Daniel chapter 11 long before they took place. It's nothing for God. Luckily, most people believe that this book was written in the days of Daniel, written by Daniel himself. Um, in fact, it was confirmed 
uh, by reference in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, three times the name of Daniel is mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. Jesus Christ himself quoted the prophecy of Daniel in his, his Olivet Discourse, where he's on the Mount of Olives talking about the end days. Now, there, there's always going to be skeptics that uh, want to dismiss prophecy. Um, yet there's always going to be seekers uh, who, who seek to learn from prophecy. So I, I hope we can be among the latter. Um, the prophecy of Daniel 11, it, it shows us that Scripture is reliable and noteworthy, which is, is, is valuable unto itself. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to toggle back and forth between your Bible and your history book. Uh, and, and you'll see what I mean. And um, as with some of the others, if you get lost, and just hang on. I've tried to make this as, as painless as possible. If you had seen me... Uh, yeah, we're going to try to do this as easy as possible. The, the Bible prophesied in Daniel 11, verse 2, it says, Three more kings shall arise in Persia. And your history book says that they did just that. Cambyses, pseudo Smerdes, and Darius I, from history, are the three rulers mentioned in the Bible. Your Bible will say in verse 2, A fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And he shall stir up against the kingdom of Greece. History again confirms Xerxes around 450 to 464 B.C. is when he ruled. And then in verse 3, Then a mighty king shall arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. Your history book again proves the prophecy is correct. And it gives us the name that many of you will recognize. Alexander the Great is who the Bible is referring to. Alexander the Great ruled between 336 and 332 B.C., 200 years after the prophecy was written. And your Bible uh, gives us details about Alexander the Great's life. In verse 4 it says, After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out towards the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. Again, if you look in your history books, in this prophecy, Alexander the Great, uh, in seven or eight years, he actually accomplished some of the most dazzling military conquests in human history. But he only lived four years after that. And then history gives us the names of the four rulers that came after, that are mentioned in the Bible. Um, Alexander the Great had four generals. Uh, Cassander, and he ended up ruling Macedonia and Greece. Lysimachus, uh, he ruled in Asia Minor. And then Seleucus uh, ruled in Syria and Palestine. And then Ptolemy, who ruled in Egypt. So there we have it, the prophecy coming true. Notice, we've only read four verses, and we've already seen the fulfillment of nine different prophecies. And, and this vision is just getting started. Uh, the remainder of Daniel 11, verses 5 through 39, kind of documents the actions of the last two of these kingdoms. Uh, Egypt to the south of Jerusalem and then Syria to the north, uh, referred to as king of the north and king of the south. Uh, and, and we're not going to go through all of that because uh, everybody would be squawking like the kids by the time we got through. Um, da Daniel 5 says this, The king of the, of the south... Uh, Ptolemy Solter is who this is, will become strong. But the king, but then the Bible says, but one of his commanders will become even stronger. And he was. His name was Secludus, the first Nicator. And he took Babylon uh, and other areas. So the Bible again in verse 6 says, the daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north and make an agreement. This happened as well. Ptolemy II sent his daughter Bernice to marry Anti Antiochus, uh, to form an alliance. And we could just keep going on and on and on. And you guys are saying, please don't. You know, the, the prophecy of, of chapter 11, it goes on to include the conspiracy to murder, uh, the nation of Egypt, uh, a defeat in battle, the, the invasion of a nation, uh, another marriage that led to, peace, to a peace treaty. And, and go home and read it. Go home and take a look at it. 
What Daniel saw in this vision, we read in our history books. And from my count, the vision of Daniel foresaw 25 major historical events over a 350-year period of time, all of which came true. You know, re remember the timeline that I gave you a while back. You know, over and over again, the book of Daniel says, this will happen, and then it happens. And, and those who pay attention will point to that timeline, and they will say, here is where we are. We have a reliable source to tell us what's going to happen next. Some, some will estimate um, that your Bible contains over 300 fulfilled prophecies about the life of Jesus alone. Uh, there are well over 500 prophecies that have been fulfilled over a variety of topics, uh, and just three of them on the life of Jesus. And 29 of those prophecies were fulfilled on the day of his crucifixion. And so, for, for, for math nerds, you know, what are the odds of something like that happening? I mean, how, how marvelous is this? I mean, that was the question that was made by a mathematician. His name was Peter Stoner. Um, he had way too much free time. He was struck by the, the, the number of prophecies that were fulfilled in, in such a short period of time uh, that we call the crucifixion of Christ, those 29 prophecies. Prophecies like this, the betrayal by a familiar friend, which is in Psalm 41, the forsaking of the disciples in Psalm 31, the false accusations we find in Psalm 35, the silence before the judges is in Isaiah 53, uh, being proven guiltless, Isaiah 53, being included with sinners, again, Isaiah 53. Uh, being crushed, Psalm 22. Read Psalm 22. Read Psalm 22 in, in the context of the crucifixion. You'll be amazed by it. It's just amazing. Psalm 22. Uh, the mockery of spectators in Psalm 109. And this again, we go on and on and on. 29 specific prophecies that had to do with the life of Jesus itself. And 29, the 29 that were fulfilled precisely by his death. What is the mathematical possibility of all of these prophecies being fulfilled in the lifetime of just one man during one season of time? Somebody smarter than me, I got this from a book, I didn't, I didn't calculate this. The answer is one out of 840, and I don't know what the number is, but there's 97 zeros after that. So one out of 84 with 97 zeros. Uh, that's the possibility of that happening. And that's amazing. That is amazing. It's not as amazing as God, but it is amazing. And Stoner goes on that to, to estimate the odds that just, just eight of these prophecies being fulfilled in the lifetime of one man. Just in just one lifetime. And, and he, was, he was from, uh, he was an Aggie, he was from Texas A&M. So uh, he wrote this. He said, consider the state of Texas. Two feet deep in silver dollars. And on one of those silver dollars, you make a mark. What are the odds that a person could, on the first attempt, select that marked dollar? These are the same odds that eight prophecies would be satisfied in the lifetime of one man. That's, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, yet all 29 of these were fulfilled in Jesus' life in just one day. Uh, so, so why? Why? Why do we, and why does the Bible make such a big deal about prophecy and the fulfillment of prophecy? And so here's, I've got, I've got three, three answers to that. The first one, uh, to, to actually to, to lay one more plank in the bridge of faith over which a doubter can walk. Prophecy, they lay one more plank on the bridge of faith over which a doubter can walk. A prophecy fulfilled, it, it strengthens our faith. It encourages us to know that, that God is in control, that God can be trusted. And someone that is, is maybe has doubt or in a weak moment of their faith, they can look at these prophecies and they can look that they were fulfilled and they can gain trust in God. They can gain trust that God is in control. You know, we all doubt sometimes. We, we all struggle to believe. We all wonder if, if what the Bible says is true. And fulfilled prophecy is just one more manner in which God kind of beckons us. 
the seeking heart to himself, and he says, you can trust me. Look at this. Look at my resume. You can trust me. And, and, and don't we need someone that we can trust, really? You know, in, in difficult times, in challenging days, you know, we, we need someone in whom we can trust. The reason's, reason for prophecy is clear. It, it's, it's to prompt us to, to kind of perk up, take note, and, 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 and place our faith in God. And then to kind of find our time, our place in the timeline that God has for us. Isaiah 46.10 tells us that God has explained the end from the beginning. And then Amos 3 verse 7. He does nothing without revealing his plans to his servants. And so what he has said, he will do. Or he has done. So you know we can conclude that, that he promises... Whatever he promises to do, he's going to do. We can trust in him. You know, so the, the reliability of Scripture, it kind of reinforces the second point, And that is the dependability of God. You know, once again, it's, it's one of the reasons for Daniel chapter 11. And you know, I admit, it's, it's difficult to study sometimes. It, it's hard to follow. Um, it, it doesn't have the, the poetry of Psalm 23. But don't dismiss it. Sit down with a paper and a pencil and a Bible and a commentary and Google and, and do the work. You know, this chapter and other chapters like it, they, they're going to put force in your faith and conviction in your confidence. There is a God in heaven and He is the God of history. And when He points to the future, we should pay attention. Which is, which is what He did in the last section of chapter 11. Uh, he gave Daniel a vision of a guy, uh, his name Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, and, and kind of the down and dirty on Antiochus Epiphanes is that he was a down and dirty kind of guy. <coughs> the prophecy in verse 21, it says, He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when its people feel secure, and he will seize it through intrigue. Now, following the death of, of Seleucus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes seized the throne and gave himself the name of Antiochus Epiphanes, which means glorious. Uh, in verses 21 through 35, uh, there, there's another list of prophecies that are precisely fulfilled in this. This, this was a bloodthirsty reign of a, a really evil monarch. In verse 22, it says, An overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. So Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, he, he did this. He did this by disposing of the Jewish high priest. Verse 23 and 24 speaks of an unprecedented alliance that's going to result in a victory based on deceit. And, and so some of you are probably going, now wait a minute, this sounds familiar. It sounds like the Antichrist. Uh, that's what the Antichrist is going to do, you know. And this prophecy is, is really kind of a, a two-fold picture of what Antiochus did and what the Antichrist is going to do in the Great Tribulation. Um, these are all prophecies fulfilled. In verse 28, his heart will be set against the Holy Covenant. He will take action against it. In verse 32, his armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple. But the people who know their God will firmly resist him. And, and Daniel, he was writing this centuries before it happened. Antiochus Epiphanes went on to profane the temple. He, he slaughtered the Jews. He turned the temple into a worship center for Zeus. Thousands were killed. All this before the Maccabean revolt in which the temple was recaptured and purified. I just want you to see prophecy after prophecy, fulfillment after fulfillment, passage after passage, scripture after scripture. You know, just you know, the, the wise take note, the, the wise take heart. God has, God has earned our attention. Uh, he has given us this book that will lead us into the future uh, by telling us about the future before it happens. Unfortunately, in, in these days of the modern Babylon that we live in, uh, very few choose to read, read this book. In these days of our Babylon, many, many actually mock the book. Um, in these days of our Babylon, they ignore the promises of God. They, 
dismiss the prophecies of God. And you know what? They mock you for taking these promises and prophecies seriously. But that's okay. The, the Apostle Peter said this, I want you to think about the words of the holy prophets spoken in the past. That's what we're doing right now as we, we think about the words of the prophet from the past. And remember the command of our Lord and Savior gave us through your apostles. It is most important for you to understand what will happen in the last days. And then Peter also goes on to say, in order to understand what will happen in the last days, study the words of the prophets in the past. They're telling us. They're giving us the answer. They're giving us the comfort. God wants you to be prepared for the last days. Um, he, he does not want you or me to be unaware or afraid. Uh, he wants us to be prepared for those last days. He, he wants us to, to be prepared to trust Him. You know, when things get bad, trust Him. You know, when, we, when we think we're going to lose hope, we trust Him. You know, so for in, in the last few weeks, we, we've seen some remarkable prophecies in the book of Daniel. Uh, we've looked at some pretty remarkable promises for the future. And you may have read these or heard these and you've kind of thought to yourself, eh, you know, is God really going to do that? Is Jesus really going to come and, and rapture the church before a great tribulation? Will God really permit the Antichrist to, to wreak havoc upon this planet? You know, will, will there really come a time when, when Jesus will descend from heaven in the company of his church? You know, will, will, will Jesus... Really, you once and for all destroy Satan in this, this great decisive battle? Do we believe this? Scripture tells us, look at how God has kept his word in the past. That's, that's the treasure. When we see these things, can we trust it? God has kept his word in the past. And, and, and let that give you the courage to, to know that he's going to keep his word in the future. Chapters like Daniel 11, and as tough as they are, they are designed to give the, the careful student faith that what God has said he will do, he will do. Um, Isaiah 42 tells us, God says, I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or praise my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. God says, hey, look, take a look at my track record. Read my resume. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've said I've done and what has happened. I can be trusted. Can we trust his word? Consider the prophecies. Can we trust his promises? The, the book of Daniel tells us that we can. God gave Daniel prophecies, and many, many, many of them have already come true, and the rest are going to in God's time. So you can bet that, that God's other promises will come true as well. God keeps his word. God has promised to give you a, a new body that will never die, that will never diminish or succumb to disease. Dare we trust that prophecy? God has, planned, uh, has promised to, to wash away your sins. Do we trust that promise? That God has promised to, to never leave you or to forsake you. Do we trust that promise? You know, when we consider the prophecies, Isaiah 46, God says, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my, promise, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. We can trust God. We can trust the promises of God. You know, no one understands everything about the future. But we can understand this, that our God is a faithful God. Uh, and if he says it, if he says he's going to do something, he will do it. Um, a, a very dear friend of mine, he's a mentor of mine, he, he used to say, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. That pretty much sums it up for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we ask you, 
uh, to, to help our hearts to be open to whatever message you would like us to receive out of your teaching today. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would use these messages from Daniel chapter 11, the, the prophecies to strengthen our own faith. Use them to call a doubter away from the cliff of disbelief. Use these words to strengthen our faith in your word. To believe that what you have said you will do, you will do. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Would you stand for our closing hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, hymn number 452. <clears throat>